So how does a biblical perspective on a miraculous creation affect scientific observation? Isn't special creationism a science stopper? Well, that's the topic that I'm going to be looking at in this video. Now, for those who've been following along or perhaps you've read my book, you'll know that uh, my version of mature creationism involves abundant processes during creation week. So as an example, I make use of the Earth's core, mantle and crust. And I do this because the solid planet was not only specially created, but many parts of it, including the crust and even some parts of the mantle are available today for scientific inspection. We can actually go out there and look at some of those things. So that means then that creationists can actually study supernaturally created objects and can therefore use those objects as an analogy for other supernaturally created objects here, but also in the universe. So um, from my other videos, I explained how we get the Earth's crust and the core from the Earth's mantle. And essentially, the crust and the core are sort of separated out of the mantle. I also explained that the science behind this hypothesis has actually been able to make crust-like rocks in the lab. And so this is an aspect of operational science. So this may mean then that God initially sort of created a magma-like uh, spherical ball, and it was on that ball that he worked to, uh, to form uh, and create and mold our planet during creation week. So God then used processes to separate out a core and a crust. So that's what I'm getting at in this video. Now that's really interesting from a creationist perspective because, uh, as I said, we can actually go out to uh, places in the world like the Canadian Shield, which as far as I know, all creationists believe uh, was specially created uh, during creation week, and we can go and study it. Now, humans have been investigating the Earth's core, mantle, and crust for well over a hundred years now, and the consensus in the entire scientific community is that the rocks of the core, mantle, and crust contain geochemical relationships indicative of natural mechanisms. Now, that's not just the conclusions of secular scientists. Uh, John Baumgartner, who's a very well-known and respected uh, creationist, uh, he says this uh, in uh, the, one of the rape books that was published in the year 2000. He says, let me begin by affirming the present day Earth structure as deduced by modern secular seismology as firm and trustworthy. Now, he goes on in the book to suggest uh, that God basically uh, separated out the core uh, and the crust from the mantle using natural mechanisms, but he did so extremely rapidly because it all occurred in six days of creation. Essentially, the rocks made during creation week don't seem to possess supernatural scars, indicative of supernaturalism. If indeed that's the case, then uh, this would mean that the crust, for example, shouldn't contain any anomalies, any sort of scientific anomalies. So what are we then to make of this as, uh, as Christians? Well, from previous videos, I've already explained that it may be that whenever God created something supernaturally, the supernaturally created objects uh, exhibited a natural history. So for example, there's Jesus's wine. Uh, there's the bread and the fish, uh, which he fed the 5,000 with. Uh, regenerated uh, retinal cells, uh, restored muscles and tendons, as well as bodies that even came back from the dead. Um, I suspect that none of these objects, cells or organs, would have actually contained scars indicative of a supernatural event. In other words, uh, they would have exhibited uh, very natural histories. So that the solid planet, which is a supernaturally created object, retains some kind of history indicative of normal, natural mechanisms should therefore not really surprise us. Now, some might question this assumption. How in the world could God have used natural processes to create the earth? And some object to this because they think I'm invoking uh, Charles Lyell's uniformitarianism. But absolutely nothing 
could be further from the truth. Yes, I'm suggesting that God used natural mechanisms, but he did so over a period of six days. I also believe that God used global flooding, rapidly moving crustal plates, and multiple mini catastrophes to reshape our planet in just a few thousands of years. No, Charles Lyell would turn over in his grave given such an assertion. Now, this isn't even close to uniformitarianism. Most object, though, because they think that natural mechanisms somehow detract from God's glory as creator. Yet, this is what we're told in Hebrews 1.3. Um, the same God who made everything sustains all of it using natural processes. He, that's Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint in his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Now, have you ever thought about the fact that God is presently at work keeping the very molecules of your body together? But how's he doing it? Is he using some sort of supernaturalism? No, he's using natural processes and laws. The Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. But what laws are at work to accomplish that feat? Again, is it supernaturalism? Well, no. It's natural processes and mechanisms working in tandem with God's divinely created instructions found in your DNA. Have you ever given praise to God for a sunrise or a sunset? Uh, what processes brought that scene before our eyes? Well, it certainly wasn't supernaturalism, but it doesn't mean that we don't stop thanking God for it. I know I do. It's wonderful. Now, in the Bible, we see multiple examples of people attributing the gift of rain and crops to God. It's truly God that makes the mountains smoke, the earth shake, and the sun rise. Job 5.10 says this, He gives rain on the earth and sends waters on the fields. Matthew 5.45 For he makes his sun rise on the evil, and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Notice, God is the one doing this through natural processes. Psalm 104.32, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. Yes, natural processes are at work to cause volcanoes to smoke. But according to the Bible writers, God is doing that, which means those natural processes are God's. In Psalm 130, uh, 104, 27 through 30, the psalmist declares uh, that these, in talking about animals, all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. And this verse is really interesting because the word created here in the Hebrew is the same word used for creation of animals in Genesis chapter 1. Now, it may be that the psalmist is thinking in terms of diversification after the flood of Noah. Um, it could be that he's just thinking about the natural birth of animals. Either way, the psalmists, uh, in the psalmist's mind, God was just as much at work creating animals through natural processes associated with speciation and or procreation as he was when he made the animals in the first place. Do you see that natural processes are God's processes? Got to get that. We shouldn't equate the presence of natural processes or natural mechanisms with the absence of God. That's a common deception uh, that's built on experience. You know, gravity's rhythmic regularity, as an example, it doesn't mean that God isn't present, upholding the universe. He's the one whose power is at work in gravity. So God is just as much at work sustaining the world today as when he created it in the first place. Therefore, is it possible that God, in anticipating the laws, the processes, and the mechanisms that he would use to sustain the universe, is it possible he used the same laws, processes, and mechanisms to create it and form it in the first place? Albeit, of course, with one very, very important variable, rates of change. So rocks form as a result of a multitude of natural processes. Imagine just one of those processes and speeding up the rate 
at which uh, one of those processes is working. Say the rate at which gravity pulls on matter. What you end up with is a very weird rock um, that contains a geochemistry that's vastly different from all other rocks. But if you speed up all the rates, you'll end up with a rock that has a geochemistry no different from a rock that crystallizes at very slow rates, say, um, in the world today. So humans use the rates at which things change as a kind of a clock. But if God is in the habit of making things very, very quickly, as he does when he withers a fig tree, uh, restores retina cells, regenerates human bodies, then humans are not given the freedom to use the rates at which those things change for the purpose of determining an age. Only God can help us differentiate between these two kinds of created things. Since no one was there to see God make the earth, we must rely on external revelation. Remember, the rocks don't have dates or ages written on them. Uh, the question must be, how are we going to interpret the geochemistry? Are we going to elevate our experience uh, with the way the world presently operates above the testimony of its creator? And this, by the way, it's not a scientific question. It's philosophical. Given the veracity of this hypothesis, it would be impossible to detect a supernaturally created rock from one made naturally at present rates. At the end of the day, this question really comes down, as I said, to a philosophical, a philosophical assumption about reality. If we reject the existence of a creator, which, by the way, is a non-scientifically motivated choice, then we can also discard the things I'm talking about. But if we accept the existence of a creator and that the Bible is his revealed word, then we have a good reason to tentatively accept this hypothesis and place the word of God above that of our experiences. And this is why the writer of the Hebrews says, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, Hebrews 1.3. As I've said elsewhere, that a creator exists is obvious in the things that are made. See Romans 1. But God's creative strategy, uh, making the universe in six days, that, that strategy can only be believed. It cannot be scientifically investigated. That's the point of Hebrews 1.3. And that, of course, brings us full circle here. If what I'm saying is correct, then scientists should be able to do good, predictive science on all the rocks of the earth, including those made during creation week. You see, the geochemistry in those rocks is natural. Just like the wheat in Jesus' bread, the cells in Jesus' fish, and the alcohol in Jesus' wine. That means creation wheat rocks can be investigated using science. These rocks contain natural geochemical relationships that can be used to predict outcomes in our own crust, but also within the crust or within the parts of planets and stars out there in the universe. What we cannot accept, however, is the time involved in the formation of these very natural rocks. And that's because God has already told us how long it took when he made them. Notice that we can now believe in a literal six-day creation without throwing out scientific methodology, at least for the inorganic realm. And so that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for uh, being with me today on Creation Unfolding. Don't forget to go check out the book. Uh, check out the uh, blog, creationunfolding.com, uh, as well as the Facebook page and the, uh, the rest of the YouTube videos. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye.